everyone, and welcome back to Doctor Who's Crown Jewels. We are in colour, finally! Sadly, this means we're saying goodbye to the second Doctor, but through happenstance, we are saying hello to number three. So, season seven. It's too good to be true. Sure, it only has four stories, but all four stories are so good that my honourable mention this week is the entire season. Watch season seven. Watch season seven. It is one of, if not the best season of the entire show. But now time to get into the crown jewel. I would say season seven, each story in it is as good as each other, bar one. One is far above the rest, and that is Inferno. Commonly thought of as the one where the Doctor goes into a parallel universe. It happens in that, but it's more so the cautionary tale of science going too far, overambition causing danger to those who are bystanders, I guess. And the parallel universe cements that. The drilling experiment go on, things starting to go wrong, and then the Doctor ending up in a parallel universe where it's further along and it's getting worse to the point where the planet is gonna die, and then returning as the sole survivor to his own universe so that he can try and stop it. And as Potluck, the person who died in the alternate universe, survived in the Doctor's home universe, meant that Earth could survive. Oh boy! That is a seven-parter, and it is pretty brutal in places. The Doctor doesn't only get a trial run, he has it on the hardest difficulty setting. Because everyone's a fascist or a slave to a fascist! Let's, let's start with Stallman. Stallman being very overambitious is as as a defining character trait and takes an element from the base under siege formula where the head of the base just doesn't listen to anyone. But I feel like because the base under siege formula works so well for Doctor Who, it makes sense to use aspects of that to try and make a good story. And Stallman embodies that. And everyone working on the Inferno project starts out kind of unlikable, but when you see them in a desperate situation in the Inferno Earth, that kind of recontextualizes how you feel about them in the normal Earth. Although that being said, Sir Keith, yeah, no, he's good. He's good in both universes. Well, I say he's good in both universes, he's dead in one universe. <laughs> but hey, you can't be evil if you're dead. <laughs> I, th I think the reason why they made him, like, quite morally likable to begin with is because they knew he wasn't going to be in the Inferno Earth. I, I keep calling it the Inferno Earth. You know, when I when I say Inferno Earth, I mean the alternate Earth in Inferno. I, th I think the biggest transformation for me was Sutton, who kind of came off as a bit playery and a little misogynistic towards Preta. And in the Inferno Earth, he really was the voice of reason and someone that was so incredibly open-minded that he became the likable one in that universe. And that's not to say he wasn't like that in the normal universe either. He was completely demonstrating that. Also, I think with Preta, she was also quite narrow-minded, like Stallman. It just wasn't a good look on Sutton's half, but, like, sometimes it makes sense, but other times, no. The Doctor being traumatised by Episode 7, really, yeah. I, like, the visible trauma on his face was beautiful to see. I love seeing my favourite characters suffering. I think other stark differences are with Benton being... Instead of this lovable soldier boy, he's a really strict military man. John Levine really sells it, as does Caroline John with Liz to Elizabeth. She was very believably the same character, but very clearly went a different path. She was going to be a scientist, but then decided to join the military, which made her a bit more narrow-minded, especially in fascist Earth. And I think the most striking one, the one that actually made it to the DVD cover, is the Brigadier becoming the Brigade Leader. Nicholas Courtney, as an actor, does what good actors do, and when playing different characters, feels like different characters. And it was clearly written that way in the script, where it's like, he's obviously meant to give off a same sort of vibe, but feel like completely different. 
and I really love that. I think the last thing I've got to talk about is the sound design. There were a lot of loud noises in it, but that makes sense. They're drilling, and also the raw power of the earth, you kind of want to have be loud, so... The sound design in this is excellent. Visual effects work gets ropey in the Barry Letts era because they like using uh, CSO, green screen stuff. And it does tend to look ropey whenever they use it. No exception here, but that's just what you gotta do in the Pertwee era. You just gotta bear that. I think the Primords also are lumped into the good sound design. I don't get why the Primords are a thing. I don't get how this like, burning hot green liquid turns you into a werewolf. I don't get it. It kind of reminds me of the paradox forms in Pokemon Scarlet, in a way. Like, paradox human! Do you like Inferno? Do you think Spearhead from Space is the best? Do you think Silurians is the best? Do you think Impossible of the Death is the best? Do you think Season Seven's bad? Why? Leave your thoughts in the comments down below, and next time, we move on to Season 8. Entering Joe Grant and the Master. Unless if you're one of those people that counted the War Chief as an incarnation of the Master, let's not go there. See ya!